Uh, hi there, Lisa. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you, James. And um, I have to say, I think one of the signs of a great music documentary is when you come out and you just want to listen to the music, which I, I did for days after watching this. And um, something that comes across in the film is just how fresh and exciting it still sounds all these decades on the music. It really hits you. Um, you know, when I need to get energized in the morning, I put on Keep a Knockin'. You know, the minute those drums come in, I'm like, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, people should set it as their alarm maybe in the morning. <laughs> um, and yeah, I just wanted to start with, like, to what extent did Little Richard himself and the way he kind of lived um, and his kind of attitude inspire your approach to making the film and putting the film together? Well, one of the first things I knew is I had to give Little Richard the mic to tell the story. You know, like uh, someone said, you can't you can't put Little Richard in the corner, um, and but it was especially important to give him agency, to be the narrator of his journey, um, the good and the complicated aspects of his life, is told by Richard, and there certainly is commentary by other people because I felt there were some things that he says that we as audience members want to go, wait a minute, I don't know about that. And that is the role of our incredible Black and queer scholars, friends, family, musicians who knew him. But it, it's, um, you know, Richard is centered because, you know, how can you not have his color, his energy, and his perspective on the choices that he made? And the point is made that, um, you know, at times he's an unreliable narrator, but I think um, you, you can kind of quite easily see in the, in the footage that we see, okay, well now he's being sort of a chat show host and being fun and, you know, maybe th th this isn't completely true. And then the moments where, okay, well, this is like very authentic. And like, did those moments really stand out to you as you were going through the footage? Uh, did it, was it quite, did it sort of jump out? Okay, th we're going to include this, maybe not so much that or... I think it's really telling with um, Richard's induction of Otis Redding into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because his anger and his bitterness, though couched in humor, comes through. And it is very important for our audience to kind of have this immersive experience provided by that archival of Richard's pain of being there inducting someone who he feels he influenced in a room full of people he feels he's influenced who were not giving him his flowers. And he is very bold and unapologetic in, in showing the receipts. And I think um, you paint a really compelling uh, picture of uh, his influence and his legacy. Um, but how important was it for you to also sort of go back and look into what shaped him? Because, um, you know, some, some of the people who shaped him have probably been, you know, overlooked and who are, are, are less known to us. So I, f I found that a really interesting part of the film too. Well, you know, um, Richard is an important part of the scaffolding of, of rock and roll. And in any origin story, you want to see who influenced this artist. And in this case, they are Black and they are queer. They're Billy Wright, they're Escarita, they're Sister Rosetta Tharp. And um, they, for the most part, their names have been, you know, erased from the telling of this history. And they are so important in the community and the musicality that they provided to Richard. Now, Richard does his own thing. I'm not saying he is sampling them, but whenever I see these hidden figures who um, we need to know about, I am so excited about using documentary as a means of uh, providing a platform of, of education. Yes, and for us to go out and find more um, about these these people too, because they're all really interesting to, um, figures. Um, I love the Chitlin Circuit uh, sequence in the film. That was one of my my favorite sequences, and the the archive just was 
th thrilling what, what you use in there. What, why was that? I mean, you, you had to, you only have about 98 minutes, I think. So you can't include everything, but why was that sort of a vital episode kind of in his life to, to include? Well, you're referring to this time in Richard's life uh, as a teenager. He's been kicked out of his home for being queer. He's taken in um, by the owners of a, a gay club in Macon, Georgia in the 1940s. So first of all, let's talk about that part of the history because people seem to feel that moments we are living in now have don't have precedence. Um, and it was important to show that. And then his going on the road in the Chitlin circuit and performing in drag. Um, I, when I made this film, I did not know that drag performances were going to be criminalized in some places. And I love that we're able to show there's this long history. Um, and it's a history that Richard's just a moment, a blip on. You know, it's a history that goes even further uh, back. And like everything in this film, uh, you, you, there's so much nuance and complexity. And the film kind of like ce celebrates that, I think, which is very much part of Richard too, because, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's separate from the drag, but the the makeup is interesting in the way that you know, we hear him talk about that, making him less threatening to kind of, to white audiences and especially to young girls, which... I think some people might be surprised by uh, today that the makeup would make him kind of a you know less threatening figure in a way. Yeah. Oh, and and you know, I think so many of the contributors to the film are there to be in conversation with Richard because for us intuitively, we are like, what do you mean, you know, in a time where homosexuality is illegal, homophobia is rampant in the 1955s you're going to wear makeup so that you're less threatening. And I love that we were able to bring in a voice who it, for me is representative of the audience going, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Um, because I there's a dialogue that is happening in the film with questioning and or applauding some of Richard's choices. And when, when you see John Waters' um, moustache, it kind of seems obvious, but I'd never actually heard him explicitly say that the moustache is sort of a, a, a tribute, twisted tribute uh, to, to Little Richard. So well, yeah, why did you want uh, John uh, Waters to be a contributor? Because he, he he brings a lot to the film, I think. <laughs> um, well, I knew that he had a tremendous regard for Little Richard. He had interviewed him, this very famous article that John Waters wrote, that he goes and he spends all this time. He has this great interview. And then Richard's like, no, I don't want it to be published. <laughs> uh, and that becomes a part of the, the story that's told in the interview. Um, but I have been intrigued. I love the film Hairspray, the original with Divine. That, you know, Hairspray is telling the story of black and white teens in Baltimore who fall in love with rock and roll who come together. And that is a part of the context of how little Richard in 1955 is affecting both black and white teenagers. So there was like so many, and then he's John Waters, okay? Um, who doesn't want to just talk to him about anything, but it, he has such a love for rock and roll. He's, you know, written this great, you know, uh, fictional work that is kind of a backstory to the story that we're telling. So it just had many layers. It made sense. Yeah. Well, Lisa Cortez, thanks so much. Congratulations again on the film. And uh, yeah, everyone's going to have such a great time time watching the movie. Thank you so much. It will be available uh, to purchase starting uh, April 21st and also in select theaters. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Lisa.